So why your finishes suck or how you can do better, some best practices. I've been thinking about this video for a while and it seems quite timely because I'm having to refinish these desktops. I had scheduled delivery on the top coat dried and I had to reschedule. Here's the mistake. By the way, I'm Caleb from You Can Make This Too. I didn't do a test sample because I used a stain color I hadn't worked with before that looked okay with the gloss, but it was glossy. I put on the satin and it just like looked like plastic. All the wood grain disappeared. It was a really dark ebony finish. It no longer looked like wood and I was not happy with it. And the customer said, it's okay, you keep it till you're happy with it. So I'm redoing it. Mistake number one is if you're using even a color of stain or anything you haven't worked with before, do some test pieces to make sure everything's gonna build properly with all the products and all the sheens and all the changes. It's uh, easier to take a day or two to do that test and make sure everything's good than it is to do your whole project and then be like, uh. And with that, show your test to your clients. If you do clients, I, I've also had conversations with clients. They think they know what they want and then I do the whole thing and I show it to them and they go, you know, I don't like it. Let's stain that. At least then though, you're doing it on their dime and not your dime because that's a change order. So I get a charge for it. But um, yes, test pieces. Okay. Most of these are pretty simple. Um, honestly, the finisher didn't fail. It just did not meet my expectations and it didn't come through how I wanted, but there was nothing technically wrong with it. It just wasn't what I wanted and what the client wanted. The two big reasons why finishes fail is because you didn't prep properly, which is generally sanding. You didn't sand properly or fill your voids properly, etc. I'll briefly gloss over that, but I have videos on wood filling and sanding. So if you wanna go deep dive on those, I have those. The other big error is you just didn't apply that product properly. Like I said, I have a video on how to do the prep properly, but basically you wanna use a wood filler if you have to do any void filling, crap, gack, scraps, whatever, and you're gonna stain it, you need a filler that's going to take stain. Many do not, especially if you like glue and sawdust, that doesn't. Uh, Timbermate is what I like to use if I need to stain. I'll just use the color Timbermate that matches closely to the wood, and that'll take the stain, look pretty similar, blends in well. If you're not staining, it doesn't really matter so much, just wanna make sure that your finish is gonna stick to whatever you're doing. Then as far as the sanding process goes, work through the grits. You never wanna skip more than one grit. So let's say there's 80, 100, 120, 150. You can go 80, 120, 180, skip uh, 100 and 150. You don't wanna go 80 to 220, because basically you wanna remove the lower grit scratches with the next grit. So when I use my 80 grit, I'm going to be cutting that wood and leaving large 80 grit cut marks, scratches in the wood. When I move to my next grip, be it 100 or 120, you can skip a grip. What I wanna do is remove past those 80 grits so I don't have big honking scratches. Cause ideally you want your final cut scratches to be small enough, they're not really noticeable by eye. Well, if I make big ones with like 36, 60, 80 grit paper, and then I jump up to 150 grit, I might make a really smooth board that feels nice, but all those big honking scratches are gonna be there. That's why you never wanna skip more than one grit. It just helps you move through that progression in a timely manner that's pretty cost efficient. So that's the deal there. To minimize any issues, don't push down on your sander, don't tip your sander on edge, keep it flat, let the weight of itself move, and you move about one second per inch, and then you overlap 50% each time. So if my sander fits here, and this is the edge, I don't go here next. On the edge, I probably wanna hang over some then my next pass is gonna be here. And then my next pass will be here. Next pass will be here. Hope that makes sense. Let's change up a little bit. So that covers prep. And again, I did two deep dive videos on those. We'll link below if you wanna go really deep into that with a lot more product and demonstrations and everything. So issue number two, improperly applying. Um, if you want to just skip the rest of this video, here's the secret. It's on the label do what the label says on your product. I'm not going to apply a finish to show you because that would only apply to whatever finish I show you, but we're gonna talk about some of the main differences. And here's some common pitfalls you probably be missing with how you apply. Some finishes um, are picky about how they be applied. Some, if you use a wipe on, wipe off, you better wipe on and wipe off. You don't wanna roll that on, it's gonna be way too thick. If you're using a wiping finish, it's probably not gonna brush very well and leave really bad brush marks. A brushing finish that's made to self-level may not spray well, so don't spray it. So see what application methods work with that finish, ideally, and then stick with that, unless you have a lot of experience and you know how to modify it, maybe with accelerators or reducers or thinning to get it to behave otherwise. But if it's your first time using a product, you know, do some tests with it and probably just follow the recommendations that the manufacturer put there. Because here's the thing about instructions on labels. 
the manufacturer wants to sell product, so they want you to have a good experience. So they want to give you the best practices and they put that right there on the can so you're happy with it. That's not the amateur hour approach. That's your best practice for using that product is doing what they want you to do or what they're recommending you do because they want you to be happy with it and buy it again. It's, there's no hidden secret. So apply it the way they recommend it unless you have experience otherwise. Now this was a tough one that got me, especially my old garage shop. And that is, well, I followed the directions perfectly and it didn't go right. There's probably one thing they recommend there that you couldn't control and so you didn't and it bit you. And that's your environmental conditions. The rule is kind of like 70-70, okay? Most finishes want to be applied around 70 degrees below 70% humidity. Anything other than that, and it might get weird. Generally, if you go colder, you're just gonna have a much longer cure dry time, but it probably used to work. Some won't, just depends on what kind of finish you're working with. And if you go hotter or it's really humid, that's where you can really get into finishes that uh, get tacky and orange peely and splot. Like weird things can happen when you're well above 70 degrees or in like 100% humidity environment. So yes, if you applied everything right and your finish still didn't come out, but your technique you know was good, it was probably the environment, i.e. you weren't close to that 70-70 and you were too cold, too dry, too humid, too warm, whatever. And unfortunately, the only real answer for that is if you can't control the environment in your shop, then you just have to wait for the right kind of weather day to do it. Um, got a buddy of mine who also sprays and uses some different products and he's learned with some of those, like if it rained yesterday or it's supposed to rain tomorrow, I can't spray this stuff because just the barometric pressure or the relative humidity, whatever is just different and it does not like it. So he needs to make sure that there's a day or two of clear weather before he uses that finish and that there's gonna be a day or two after because otherwise it just, it just doesn't act right and that's just an environmental consideration. So odds are if your finish isn't coming out right, it's probably your own fault, but it might not be. So keep that in mind. And in that vein of it might not be your fault, um, there's one other thing that is your fault, but it's kind of not. But then we'll get into the things that you can fix that are definitely your fault. If you're using multiple products, which is common a lot of times, you know, we might use a stain and then a finish, or we might use a wood filler and then put finish on that. My finishing process, there's normally multiple products from whatever I'm filling with to maybe a stain and then a top coat. And when I top coat, I often use a gloss to build layers and then use a satin on top of that. Or I might do an oil rubbed finish or Danish oil or something for color, but then use a film building top coat. So you have multiple products and if they're incompatible, you can't really help that. All you can help that is by choosing products that you know are compatible and that just varies by manufacturer and stuff. I don't know all the rules on that. One to keep in mind is shellac is considered a universal finish. So shellac tends to stick to anything and anything sticks to it. So if you have two products you really want to use and you've tested them and for whatever reason they just like aren't bonding well properly or just not acting right, try to use shellac as an in-between. And that's sort of a nice little barrier that normally makes any two incompatible finishes suddenly work. Another good rule if you're trying to get finishes that runs into why finishes might not work is doing water over oil. And the problem there is oil-based finish needs to fully cure. So you're looking at at least seven days of that oil-based finish sitting before you can put any type of water-based product on top of it. Oil over water normally isn't as big of a deal, but especially if you're talking about different brands, uh, mixing oil versus water can be an issue, be aware of that. But again, as long as the oil is fully cured, you can always use shellac as an in-between. Another good in-between for making sure products bond well is to do a light sanding with like 320 or 400 grit paper. That way you abrade the surface and give something for that finish to mechanically bond to. That's not always an option though. Like let's say you laid down stain, now you want a top coat, but that top coat isn't gonna stick to it. Well, you don't wanna go sand your stain because that's gonna all show up in your stain job. That's where the shellac can come in if there's some product you really want a top coat with for some reason that isn't compatible with that stain shellac is a good answer. But a good way to avoid that whole process is just pick a brand and stay with it. I really like to use General Finishes products and I also use Total Boat products. And generally I don't mix the two. If I'm using Total Boat, I stay with Total Boat. If I'm using General Finishes, I just stay with General Finishes and I know those work together. And even on the can, if you read the back of a General Finishes can, you know, they're warrantying everything. One of the things they say is like, hey, if you used anyone else's products and mixed it, tried to stack layer or whatever, like, uh, we make no promises about what's gonna happen. We know all of our stuff works together. You mix it with someone else. But anyway, jumping back to things that are definitely your fault that are easy to fix. A big one 
is recoating too fast. That finish not being dry enough to add another coat. Every label will give you times, but we also have that environmental consideration. The label will also tell you if you're working outside of the ideal environment, we cannot guarantee our times. Times may vary. It always says if it's colder, it might take longer. So the best litmus test is to get some really fine grit paper, like uh, at least a 220. And if I think something's ready to be recoded, I take that paper and I do what's called the white dust test. Do a little sanding. And if you get back white sanding dust, which is just the finish, having sanded off, you're good. Well, what's bad? If it's gummy at all. So obviously you probably already touched this, so you know it's not tacky to the touch or anything like that. You run that sandpaper, if all you get is fine dust, no tacky, gummy, et cetera, you probably are good to recoat. Unless it's a finish that needs to cure, and if your can tells you you need to wait days between recoating or top coating, then that's a curing process, not a drying process. So you might do the white dust test, and like, oh, it's dry, yeah, it's dry, but it hasn't cured yet which is a chemical process, not a dehydrating process. We're just trying to evaporate water and leave back solids. Curing is like all these molecules gotta do sciencey stuff. And that takes time, and if you haven't given it the time, it hasn't happened. So if you recoat too fast, that can be a problem, again, that's on the label. One of the things that can make you inadvertently recoat too fast for, you might think things are dry, but they're not really, is the second point that I think is also where a lot of people often go wrong, and that's coating too heavy. Most finishes like to be applied very light. And if you look on the back of the can, it will advise you. My philosophy on this is all, lighter is almost always better, because if I go, lighter it's just going to dry faster and i just do more coats but if i go too heavy bad things can happen or it's really aggravating because i like to try to wrap my finish within a day day and a half time frame start to end where if you just get a heavy spot somewhere now i might have just tripled the cure time on that one spot but i can't do anything else on the project until that one spot cures because you got to want to do the whole surface in one go so don't go too heavy and how heavy is too heavy for my product well it's on the can. It'll tell you, <coughs> excuse me, it'll tell you often in mills. If you're not familiar with that or just don't have much experience, I don't have a gauge for this, but you can order finished thickness gauges and it just kind of looks like a little comb that's got numbers and mills. And you just, you, what you do is you apply finish and you scrape that and it shows you how thick your finish is and you just make sure that matches whatever the manufacturer said. So if you want an actual gauge to, to check because you've been having problems, I'll find one on Amazon and link it. If you have a 3D printer, I'm sure you can find a file. If you have a laser cutter, you can probably find a file and cut one with a laser or something. But yeah, too thick, recoating too soon. Light is better and more coats and uh, make sure it's fully dry before you add the next coat. Another thing with the recoating and properly, if it says you need to sand between coats, then you need to sand between coats. Finishes kind of work two ways. It's either a chemical bond or mechanical bond or combination. A chemical bond would mean like molecules are fusing some type of level actually bonding, but many, especially film finishes, it's more of a mechanical bond. What that means is your wood isn't like perfectly smooth like you'd imagine. It's kind of gnarled on a very small microscopic level. And then the finish comes in and it fills in all those places and kind of gets to grab and hold on. That's important for it to be able to do it. But what if I put on finish and it was gnarled and that first coat of finish grabbed well, but then it cured and because it was liquid, it balanced and now it's nice and smooth. And then I spray, pour, roll, brush, whatever, another liquid right on top of a glassy surface, it's got nothing to grab onto. So it might just flake off, peel off. So that's where if a finish says you need to sand between coats or you always see this caveat, you don't have to sand between coats if you recoat within one hour or two hours. Otherwise, you've got to wait 12 hours for it to fully cure and dry and then sand it and then recoat. Those are the directions, make sure you follow it. I'm not a chemistry major, so I can't get into the whole like recoat in this window and you're good, but it has to do with the chemicals being able, it being cured enough that, you know, the base layer is going to dry and cure fine, even though a new wet layer is going on top, but it's still in this happy place where they can kind of fuse together. The base doesn't have to be abraded, 
for the new surface to be able to bite and hold on to. Just basically follow the label. And what else? Last but certainly not least, I probably should have put this sooner because it's important. Play to your strengths. I spray finish. And the reason I spray finish is because that is how I personally get the best results. And I get the best results in spray finish because I spent a little time learning how to use my sprayer. I invested in a nice sprayer because I can't brush to save my life. If you ask me to brush on a finish that looks like crap, I've tried learning, I've had people show me, I've practiced, I cannot get a brush finish to look good. So before I started spraying, I would only use wipe on wipe off finishes. Uh, General Finishes Armor Seal. It's a nice building finish that looks pretty good. There are other finishes that come out better, but they're not wipe on, wipe off. And a lot of people like to kind of poo poo on Armor Seal because they're like, oh, everyone says this is better than this other product. But if I do side by side, you'll pick this one. It looks better and it's not the Armor Seal. Cool, whatever. I like Armor Seal because it's a wipe on, wipe off and it looks great and I can do it and have it look great. If I've got to roll it or roll and tip or brush it. So I only did wipe on, wipe off until I got a good spray rig learned how to spray, that was fairly easy for me, and I do that. If you just can't get your around spraying, you have a spray rig, borrowed a spray rig, tried one, then just don't do spray finishes. Go wipe on, wipe off. If you brush or roll well, then do that. If you can't do any of it, wipe on, wipe off. General Finishes Armor Seal works great. It's a very hard finish to mess up, so long as you're working in the environment you're supposed to, you know, it's not too humid or too dry, but it's fairly forgiving. It's on the forgiving your side of finishes, I feel. Lightly sand between coats, you'll be fine. Um, nope, the rain is distracting me. Totally ruined my train of thought. Mm. I personally don't have any experience with it, but there's the new wax oil finishes like um, Osmo and Mono Coat, where it's like the two part and then you just wipe it on and buff it. I haven't tried those yet, but those seem to be kind of less learning curve, less trick finesse type finishes, so long as you mix the two components well enough. So that might be something to try if you're struggling. But yes, play to your strengths. Don't feel like you have to be good at every kind of finish because I'm certainly not. Find what you're good at, get better at it so you're happy with it, and um, stick stick with that. Uh, outro. But there you go, I'm thinking about, I don't like this. Ah, here it goes. I've been thinking about doing a video on spray finishing because I feel I've kind of cracked the code and I'm very happy with my results. If you're interested in that and you want to get better at spray finishing and try that, let me know in the comments and I might do that. If you're the kind of person who likes to like, comment, share, super, super thank you. It goes farther than you imagine in helping this actually work. If you're not, that's cool. Thank you for coming along for the ride. I appreciate your viewership and I hope you learned something. I hope you were inspired or at least entertained. And until next time, make time to make something.